What is up, team? Welcome back to the show. Today, I am joined once again by the man, Brian Borstein. Brian, thank you for being back, dude. It's been a while. Yeah, it has. I think we knocked out like three or four of them in the first like year or two of your podcast. And uh, maybe we're on like a year hiatus now. So it's good to be back. Yeah, it's been too long. Always good to have you back, man. Um, I'm excited to get into our topic for today. But really just fill us in on what's been going on with you lately. I know you've been going through a fat loss phase. It seems like that's been going well. So just fill us in with what's been going on with you lately. Yeah, totally. Um, well, I finished my last fat loss phase in uh, September of 2021 which yeah. ended at a uh, 182.8. So that was, that was my low eight up into the photo shoot, did the photo shoot around 185, 186, um, which was the same. I did it the prior year, but the prior year I didn't eat up into it. I just ate down to, to okay. 185. And uh, I think it turned out significantly better this time around. So with all the, the data and research we have now on like, you know, Birdo has been all big on like uh, eating up into shows and stuff like right. that. I feel like uh, it was cool to experiment with that and then see, see that that worked out for me. But um, since then, I've basically been in my off season escalation pattern. Um, my goal this off season was to not get as heavy as prior off seasons. And it's not like I blew up in off seasons prior. I would say I got to like, you know, 200 202 something like that um but this time i ended my off season in the 195 range and so that saved me you know five or seven pounds on the way back down and that's great because my plan for this diet was to start it earlier and end it earlier than prior years um, i didn't want to be dieting all the way through the summer like i've done the past couple of years because it kind of takes away the fun you know you can't have a couple beers you can't go out to eat with the fam like all that stuff so so this time i started the diet in uh late march like march 26th or 28th or something and my plan is to be done with it by june 29th so basically march april may well basically April, May, and June, three months, um, 12 week diet. And the goal is to get down to around 182 again, this time it's a 13 pound drop instead of an 18 pound drop. Um, okay. and see how 182 looks this time around. And then Birdo has been up in my ear about, um, like if I want to eventually take it to stage, which I'm still unsure about for, for a number of reasons. But, um, if I did, he's thinking, you know, I'd have to be 170 and, mm -hmm that's still quite a ways from 182 to 170. Like those are a big 12 pounds. So uh, he was like, you know, try to hang out in the low to mid 180s. So I don't know how well I'm going to do it that, but I'm at least going to give it like a, a Boy Scouts try and then see okay. if I can somehow <laughs> manufacture a lifestyle that, you know, keeps me in the two, high 2000s calorie range. Um, which is going to be a little bit restrictive, but if I can do that and I can just hang out and make like 182, 185 range, my, my homeostasis, then I think that drop down to 170 from there would be a little bit more feasible. But, um, basically that's where I'm at right now. And in the last four weeks of my diet now, just kind of looking forward to, to getting back to normal life and have some, some energy for my training and, uh, and all that good stuff too. Okay, absolutely. So you staying a little bit leaner this time around versus your last few building seasons, so to speak. Do you think that at all impacted the amount of games you were able to make during that time? Or was that was that something going into that with did you go into that with the mindset of hey, it'll be easier for me to leaner in the future? Or maybe I don't need to gain as much as I thought I needed to initially to add more fish. I mean, I, I don't I just don't know that at this point in my journey, 25 years in that like there's more gains to be had by going to 202 versus 195. Um, okay. Like, I think that's the difference between being at 14 to 15% body fat or like 16 to 18% body fat. Right. And I just kind of feel like you're in kind of a good state to train anyways. And the thing about me getting up to the like 200 range is that I can't do that with clean foods. So I end up feeling a lot worse when I start getting into that uh, weight range, just because it's being done with a lot of like pizzas and cheese steaks and French fries and like all the things I love. But like, it's just, you know, when you have to do that, it, it's not that I can't even say it feels burdensome because it's still enjoyable, <laughs> but you right. just don't feel great. You know what I mean? Like you just feel slow and sluggish and like, you know, you feel like a fat kid kind of. No, absolutely. I'm always very impressed with people who like, like straighter, at least from what I see, it seems like he does such a good job of moving foods. 
I feel like for me, once I'm above like 350 grams of carbs, I'm like, fuck, man, I gotta pull back on the nutrient density a bit. But no, I can, I can definitely relate to that. Okay, super interesting, man. Now for you, uh, that final, like going from 185, for example, to about 182, do you feel like the diet gets pretty grindy about that point? Or like right now, it's still pretty comfortable? No, that's, ex- you're exactly right. It's going to get a little more grindy to get down to 182. Like up until now, like these first 10 pounds to get to 185 have mostly been positive. Um, I actually talked about this on my podcast and on my story a lot, how I feel like a better version of myself now. Like I actually am sleeping way, way better. Um, my HRV scores are better. My VO2 max is improving, you know, per whatever my stupid device on my, on my wrist says, um, I I feel better. Like I have more energy, uh, more mental clarity, more focus, like all the things that people say are, are bad when you start dieting have improved for me uh, thus far. But, but exactly as you're kind of alluding to, there is a point where you're going to get below a point where, you know, it's no longer beneficial for you to, to be eating less, like, like it has been for me. Um, and that the scales are going to flip a little bit and it's, it's going to, a, it's going to be hard. I'm going to be hungry. I'm probably going to be lethargic. And like right now I still am excited about getting my steps in. I'm like, yeah, I get to go for a walk. It's a beautiful day type thing. And I know like toward that, like 180 range, it's going to be more like, Oh man, it's laborious. I got to go put one foot in front of the other and put my 2000 steps on there or whatever, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, su- I'm kind of surprised that that number for you is so low. Do you hold most of your, do you hold a lot of that in your lower body or why, why is that? Okay. Yeah. So that's really, uh, I'm in a, um, a private like WhatsApp group with, uh, Dave McConey and Abel. And so we're always yeah. like talking shit all day long about the industry and, you know, throwing ideas off of each other and stuff like that. But, uh, one of the things that, that, that Abel said when he looked at some pictures of me, uh, post-workout the other day was he was like, man, you're like, you know, 8% body fat in your torso, like 10 or 12% in your quads and 22% in your hamstrings. And I don't know if that's like completely accurate, but what it, what it right. is, is, is truth in the sense that I do hold a lot or all the majority of my fat in my hamstrings and glutes, which is fucking amazing if you're just trying to like go to the beach and look good, but right. awful if you're trying to, to be a bodybuilder because I, this is like my main hesitance on even why I would go to stage or not go to stage is because I, I fear that I'm going to have to sacrifice a ton of upper body mass, like real legit muscle that I had to build over right. time. I'm going to have to sacrifice a lot of that to get my hamstrings lean enough um, to get to stage. So that's like a real consideration for me. And I really don't even feel good saying this, but there's like a small piece of me that wants to go do like men's physique or possibly classic physique at a higher extreme. Right just because then I can show off the assets that I have and hide the things that I don't have. And it's just, it's a little frustrating, man. Cause like I've been on a hamstring specialization cycle for almost a year now, since I went up to meet with Berto and Brian minor, it must've been September last year. So it's been eight months of hamstring specialization or something. And I don't even know if my hamstrings are weak or not. I just know that they hold a lot of body fat, but they've never (laughs) been lean enough for me to actually see if in fact they are a weak body part. So um, I don't know, dude, there's, there's pros and cons to this whole thing for sure. Okay. Okay. One last question here. I apologize. We've got kind of off topic here, but with that hamstring specialization cycle and with where you're at, it doesn't sound like you're like able to necessarily see like a lot of these hamstring pains. What are kind of the primary metrics you've been using to assess whether you're progressing there or not? Yeah. I mean, the seated leg curl is for sure going to be the most applicable one because you're going to have the least mm-hmm. compensation from other muscle groups. Um, so absolutely the seated leg curl progression is, is the main thing I'm looking at. And I do two variants of that. I have a short overloaded version where I pause in the contracted position and mm-hmm. I do that on quad day. And then I have a, uh, a more lengthened mid range overload version that I do on hamstring day to cause a little bit more damage. And on that one, I don't pause in the contracted position. I just kind of explode through. And so both of those variants have been improving throughing the off season. Um, I've been using the same machine for 
a year and a half now. So it's not like I have, I could say it's like neural adaptations or anything like that. Um, so I think that that, that's a positive. And then, um, I'm just trying to hammer them with volume. Like I know that you can't just take one to one and say more volume is going to equal more muscle growth. But, um, the big issue that I have had with my hamstrings in the past is that they're, uh, very, they're subjective to high muscle damage as, as many people experience, I think. Um, are you, are you the same way? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I would do like, you know, two sets of RDLs and two sets of leg curls and I'd be sore for four days type thing. Um, so I've gradually worked my volumes up over time. And, um, now I'm actually able to like, like just my last session, I'm in week four of my meso. So things are starting to progress pretty far into, um, have I talked with you at all about how I progress short and lengthened overload movements at all? I've listened to you talk about it on okay. the podcast. Yeah. I think I'm pretty familiar, but yeah, not cool. On the show. Yeah, yeah. So real quick for the listeners, the length and overload movements being like the RDL and the squats and stuff like that. I usually just follow a four, three, two, one, zero type RIR progression week to week where mm-hmm. you're getting a little bit closer to failure. Um, but for short overloaded movements like your rows, pull downs, uh, leg extensions, leg curls, things like that. Um, I'll usually progress from like two to one to zero RIR and then go into partials the next week. And then from there, other techniques to add intensity to the length and position, like reverse drop sets and and things like that. So, um, so now just this week and week four, I'm starting to add in some of these intensity techniques to the short overloaded movements. So I was able to take my leg curls into partials. Then I took my hip extensions, uh, 45 degree hip extension into a reverse drop set which kind of had partials in the lengthened range. So it would emphasize the hamstrings a little bit more. And then I was able to do two sets of RDLs after that. So that's six working sets of hamstrings. And uh, they're still like, this is three days later now. And they're still like very, very slightly sore. um, But just at the right point where I went and I did my my, uh, short overloaded hamstring curls today on quad day. So I'm like, okay, you know, training them if they're just very mildly sore and you know there's not going to be any performance loss type thing but now i'm getting right. to eight sets of hamstrings per week basically six in one session two in the other and uh i'm taking those eight sets to failure and i and i seem to be recovering fine so um so my hamstring volume is is kind of climbing slowly um and yeah those are kind of the measures i'm using to 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 determine that something's happening Okay, but right now you're at eight total sets per week for hamstrings. Yeah. Okay. So still, like, you would definitely, I wouldn't, like, consider that high volume by any means. And I think I've heard you talk about this. You started to talk about it from podcasts where it seems over time, like, it, at least from the sounds of it, you're, the training volume you're using as you execute it better and better has just decreased more and more and more. Is that pretty accurate? Yeah, that's, like, the, the exactly how I would say it, too. It's like what Birdo was saying on our podcast, too, like, kind of the same idea. He's, like... I just have spent this last year doing a shoulder and arm specialization cycle. And I was like, Oh, how is that volume compared to like, you know, prior cycles or, you know, other muscle groups or whatever. And he goes, Oh, it's the lowest volume I've ever done for my shoulders and arms, which just seems like an oxymoron, right? Like, Oh, I'm specializing, but the volume's super low. Um, so yeah, I think there really is something to that. Um, to the, to the execution piece and just being able to get more out of every rep and every set. And, um, and I mean, I can feel it, dude. Like there's just something about lowering a weight under control and actually like feeling that muscle lengthen. And then you can kind of like manipulate pelvis position at the bottom or top of reps, depending on what type of movement it is and almost stay more engaged than you would be if you were just kind of going up and down type thing. Um, Mm -hmm. and it's, 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 it's a way to create tension on a muscle that I honestly could say I never was, was thinking deeply enough. Like I wasn't a cerebral enough bodybuilder to pay attention to that sort of stuff in the past, but in the last like three years or so, it's kind of progressively become a point of focus. And I I think that I'm finally kind of hitting my stride with all of that. Okay. So one more question for you here. I, we, again, we got way off topic here, but it seems like everybody kind of follows a bell curve with volume where, hey, we start with beginners, we progress very well on all volume. And then it seems like most everyone in that intermediate stage tends to do a shit ton more volume. And then as they get more advanced, they seem to like start bringing that back down. 
do you think like at that intermediate stage, and this is such a broad question, but do you think like there's actually a need for that higher volume at that intermediate stage where like maybe people just don't execute as well, so maybe they do need more volume? Or do you think that's just like, hey, really, you probably just should have focused on better execution and you never actually needed to ramp your volume up? Like, do you think there's anything to that? Or I'd be curious your thoughts there. Yeah, yeah. I actually think that that's exactly like you hit the nail on the head. I mean, the almost like one of the defining ways of being an intermediate, like looking beyond how quickly you progress session to session, but mm -hmm. almost to me, a defining characteristic is that you don't have that precise execution dialed in. Right. Um, so I almost feel like just by the nature of getting that precision in your movement and that ability to connect so deeply with the exercise, that that is one of those stepping stones that, that kind of gets you to being advanced. Um, so I, I almost think that like, if you're an intermediate and you're throwing weight on the bar at the expected rate of progress, call it five pounds a month or something along those lines, right. that is almost like prohibitive to you having to become so precise because you're like, I'm progressing. So I don't need to worry about, this like cerebral side of the game because right. I'm not there yet. Like I can just keep adding weight and like, I'll deal with that if I need to in the future type thing. Um, okay. I mean, you could be an intermediate that decides to be super neurotic and focus on that type of stuff as an intermediate. I just think that you're kind of wasting your time because you haven't put enough time under the bar to like almost be a, be able to achieve that yet. So just focus right. on progression and like using good enough form and like it will come over time type thing. Okay. That is super interesting. That's very well played. You definitely like had a different thought process around that. That's kind of just something I had been thinking about more recently, but yeah, I, I really like that. That makes good sense. All right. So now that we're 20 minutes into the episode, let's get into what I originally wanted to chat about here, which was super sets. Now really primarily in this conversation, I'm going to center a lot of this around same muscle group supersets and kind of just get your thoughts on like how you go about sequencing things, how beneficial you think they are, etc. Now, when it comes to same muscle group supersets, um, I know I'm kind of like where I've been in the past and a lot of like the content creators, educators that I follow, well, kind of there's two arguments when we're talking about same muscle group supersets. So the argument against it is typically, okay, so if we just did, for example, like we're talking about a lengthened overload movement and a shortened overload movement, if we just did those like straight sets on my lengthened sets and then I move on to my shortened overload, overload movement, I just do straight sets there, we'd be able to probably use a heavier load for both of those movements, um, which would yield more progressive overload and the volume over time. Thus, it doesn't make sense for us to do like same muscle group supersets. Now, um, more recently, specifically like when working through anyone education's course, and as I've learned more about like their approach to things, and I don't want to like phrase this incorrectly, but my interpretation of their thoughts, because I know they do use a lot more same muscle group supersets, is essentially if we pair these two movements together, um, we can create more significant tension on the tissue in less time or potentially with less overall work, right? So there's kind of these arguments for both like why we shouldn't do these and why we potentially should do these. So my question for you here is kind of what's your take here? Like it, really if time isn't necessarily, which I don't know if that's a realistic because I think time is a limiting factor for almost everyone, but if time isn't necessarily a limiting factor, like are there advantages to doing same muscle group supersets or do you think it's something we should avoid for the most part for a hypertrophy training? I think maybe the answer to this depends on what your kind of philosophical viewpoint is on whether uh, the actual number on the bar is important or not, or if the muscle only knows tension. Because I, I think that like you could look at it from both sides, right? Like I am back squatting 400 pounds for five. So my, my body is capable of 400 pounds for five when I'm fresh, right? Well, if I go do leg extensions first, and then go back squat, I can still find a weight to do five reps with to failure. Maybe it's 275 pounds or something like that. Maybe it's 225. But as long as I'm hitting that failure point at five reps, does my muscle know that I'm not using 400 and that I'm only using 225? Or does my muscle just know that it's putting in the work and it's doing the best that it can without compromising form to get me from point A to point B? Um, and I think that that like, 
I, I don't know. Where do you stand on that argument? <laughs> I mean, I would say just from who I'm learning from more recently, I would say, I mean, to my understanding, mechanical tension is going to be the primary driver of hypertrophy. I think it can push for progressive overload for a long time and not necessarily see as much hypertrophy where I do think like if we're increasing significant tension, at least from my perspective, that that would probably be more conducive to hypertrophy. I can't say for certain though. I don't feel that I conflict. And I mean, they're so interrelated too. It's somewhat hard to separate the two. Which side of that argument do you feel like you fall on with like tension versus again, more like increasing the the form with decent technique? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the safer bet is probably to say that you just stick with straight sets. Like if you were, if you were in this polarizing world where you had to be like only free exhaust or same muscle group supersets and only straight sets, you know, I think the safe bet is probably to fall on the straight set side just because there's more data supporting that. We know through history that people have gotten really jacked doing straight sets. Um, but there's certainly like a piece of me that is, intrigued enough and believe in tension enough to say that I'm not entirely confident that that's the right choice. I think it's safer, but it might not be the right choice. Um, and then I'll caveat that with a whole ton of things. So, (laughs) so I, I think same muscle group supersets are probably something that you want to save as a tool in your toolbox as most things that I advise in okay. that as you go through your journey, there are going to be times where you get stuck and you need to pull a card. And it's really cool to be able to have some cards to pull instead of feeling like you've used all your cards and now you're only left with like duds. Right. Um, right. So I think that that's certainly one like really important avenue is, is understanding that, that that's maybe better for an advanced or late intermediate type stage. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So within that, basically then what you're saying is like, if we're only using straight sets and we're at this place where we're no longer progressing, basically the only tool we have is to like add more straight sets, right. And add a significant amount more time. Is that pretty accurate? Yeah. I mean, it's just like, sometimes you, you got to give your body a different stimulus. Like I'll even reference some of the N1 stuff. Like if you're just sitting there doing straight sets all the time, might you find anabolic resistance? Um, might you find that your conditioning is suffering or that the neural adaptations are suffering and you find potentially that you could jump out into a metabolic phase or a strength phase, and maybe there would be, uh, some benefits that you could grab over there. Um, designing a metabolic phase like if we if we if we move forward with the idea that there is benefit in a metabolic phase even to begin with which i think i think is arguable like i i think there's there's good rationale for it um but i also know that people have gotten really big and not done metabolic phases for years so there it's like is it more optimal maybe but if we operate on the idea that metabolic phases have value then I think that now the conversation of how to implement these, these supersets, specifically same muscle group supersets, gets really interesting. Um, because then you start getting into the idea of like putting the short movement second or doing short, short instead of length and short. Um, and then, you know, obviously if you're in a mechanical tension phase, which maybe I think maybe I'm deviating quickly, too quickly from, from your topic, because maybe yeah. what you're focusing, what? Oh, you're good. You're good. Okay. Yeah. Cause I think what you, what you're asking though, is more like about a mechanical tension block and then yes, how sir. might, might we implement these, these supersets for that purpose. So to kind of not deviate too much from that yet, and I'll let you drive the conversation. Um, I, I think that, you know, if we're going to do these supersets and we're going to assume that there is some value in them for a late intermediate or advanced trainee, um, at least mm-hmm. enough value to, say that maybe the opportunity cost is worth the risk, right? Um, Then I think that now we're looking at something where going uh, short lengthened or lengthened lengthened probably has has the most value in a a phase like this. Okay, okay, absolutely. So then again, just to give the listeners a little bit more context, again, when we're talking about the mechanical phase, we're basically talking about the hypertrophy phase where the goal is accruing a lot of mechanical tension. So let's go ahead and get into that, man, because again, the idea of like moving short to lengthen or lengthen short, 
like typically like when I was first learning about program design, it was very much like, hey, now people weren't at the time I never heard anyone talk about like thinking overload versus short term overload. But it was basically like, hey, you want to train your compound movements first, right? And then we'll do isolation movements second, which is to generalize, like generally that would be like moving from to short. So when we're looking at that like LinkedIn to shorten versus short to lengthen, why is it from your perspective that like for a mechanical tension phase, short to lengthen would potentially be more ideal than lengthen to short? So from my understanding, it's that the movement that is done second is going to be done under the state of most fatigue and is therefore going to take the majority of the stimulus. Okay, okay. So if we're looking at like, let's say you're going from a cable chest fly to a dumbbell bench press, for example, yep. then the majority of the stimulus is going to be then coming from that dumbbell bench press. But do you think that's going to have a significant impact on our performance in that dumbbell bench press? Again, I was, yeah. I was talking to Alex about this piece of it as well. Um, and his argument was, well, we probably wouldn't see like a huge fall off there because mostly like in that, most of the overload, like chest wise, probably going to be a short position where we're hardly going to get any tension in that bench press in the second. I don't know. It's just, it's such an interesting conversation as a whole. No, I mean, I think there would be significant, um, significant problems there on the second movement. Um, and, and the example, so my, my favorite superset ever for, for chest is mm -hmm. to do some sort of um, adducted like fly movement and yeah. then drop down into push-ups and, and okay. just do push-ups from there, right? And regardless of whether I go from a dumbbell fly to push-ups or from like a cable fly to push-ups where one is short overloaded and one is lengthened, the push-ups mm -hmm. still are impacted similarly maybe 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 going from the fly to the push-up is their slight performance decrement but we're talking about me getting like eight push-ups or nine push-ups versus like 10 to 12 push-ups so either way i'm so far below what my capacity is for push-ups that both of them are affected majorly by by the prior work you know Okay, so basically then when we're moving from, and I'm kind of like, for the listeners, I'm kind of trying to conceptualize this as we're talking through this, because this, the big reason I want to have you on was to get your thoughts on this. So within this, basically then what you're saying is like, for that length of movement to come second, the stimulus that we're accruing per rep, even if we might not be able to lift this heavy weight, the stimulus that we're accruing per rep, the amount of mechanical tension, I think it's safe to say that we're getting, is going to be larger than it would be if we were like just doing a single straight set, right? Or, so when we flip that on its head, if we go lengthened to shortened, then again, that shortened movement, if we did that second, that would be the one where again, we're accruing, like we're getting a little bit larger stimulus out of that, but it's the, just the thought process of time not being, not necessarily uh, kind of being inferior, so to speak, to going from short to lengthened, just because again, it's, short overload as a whole. So again, we're, we know it's not going to be quite as conducive to hypertrophy. Did that rambling question make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when the, when the short movement is second, mm -hmm. the primary stimulus is going to be the uh, accrual of metabolites in the muscle. So okay. it's not going to be as much like mechanical tension failure as like metabolic failure. Um, which makes sense because if you're going lengthened, like let's just in your mind think you're going like incline dumbbell curl to like cable spider curl. So, so your lengthened position is, is sort of getting, getting worked by the incline dumbbell curl. But by the time, but when you get to the spider curl, it's like, it's so far short overloaded that that bottom position of the spider curl is going to be easy regardless. Like even though you still fatigued it on the incline curl, the weight that you're going to be able to use on the spider curl is going to be low enough that that first few inches of range of motion are barely going to be impacted at all. And most of the struggle is going to be the last few inches of the spider curl. So like for me, at least on a spider curl, I can usually grind through a bunch of reps. Like even when I think like I'm close to failure, I then get like five more of them. Um, and I notice that even more 
when when I do the the incline dumbbell curl to spider curl superset because it really mm-hmm. is just it localizes the fatigue to like just the top few inches of the movement um, because the weight has to be a little bit lighter since you're already fatigued going into it and then there's like no nothing to fight through at the bottom it's a weird it's a weird sensation but you can definitely feel when you do it that it's more of that metabolic impact and it's less just like raw mechanical tension and stimulus. Okay. Okay. That, that makes complete sense. That's, that's very helpful. Okay. And then from there within, let's just keep this because to avoid like too many generalities, let's just keep this like if you were programming for yourself. So like when you're writing your own programs, how are you choosing like when you're going to implement or hypertrophy, when you're going to implement, like I say, muscle groups or something like this? Yeah, I usually save them towards the end of um, of macro cycle blocks. So like, for example, right now I'm in a beginning of a hypertrophy block. I just did a five-week metabolic block that ended at the end of March. Did it end at the end of March? No, it ended in the end of April. Um, and And so I'm in hypertrophy now for the next four to six months probably. And, uh, I, I, th- I think of it as a tool in the toolbox. So right now I'm pretty much doing all straight sets in my program. When I look at each day, yeah, there's not a single, uh, same muscle group superset in there. I have, uh, it, it, the antagonist supersets are weird because some people program them as, and they just assume that if you're alternating movements, that it's a superset. But the way I program it is it's like, you know, triceps, rest a minute or two, biceps, rest a minute or two, then back to triceps and kind of do it like that. So I don't call those supersets because there's just equal rest between each one. Um, but some people do. So I do have some of those and those are mostly just time savers to give my triceps more rest and do biceps and then, you know, have more rest type thing. But as far as same muscle group supersets go, I have none of those in there and I'll probably go through at least one more mesocycle after this upcoming deload that I implement um, before I even think about adding in some same muscle group supersets. And then eventually at the end of the block, maybe after my next deload week, then there would be potentially the need to add that as a tool, but it would be something I would, I would grab as a, a place to go if things aren't moving as I'd want them to move just, normal hypertrophy stuff, you know, like straight sets. Um, and if I were to do that, man, it's, it's interesting. I haven't actually thought about how I would implement them because in the past I've used, uh, them for both quads, hamstrings and delts and chest, I guess. Um, I don't tend to use them for back because you almost can't isolate back stuff. It's like everything involves the biceps so it just, it just kind of doesn't make sense to me. Um, okay. Like I used to went back in my bro days, I used to superset straight arm pull downs with pull-ups all the time or straight down, straight yeah. arm pull downs with regular pull downs, you know, okay. but now I look at the straight arm pull down and it just kind of seems like a movement that lacks utility now that I, I like know more. Um, right. So do you feel the same way about it? Yeah, it's not something that I ever really program anymore. It kind of seems silly, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I don't do it really for back, but uh, for quads, like I would say, I would say when I do implement these supersets into mm-hmm. my hypertrophy phase, it will probably be almost all pre-exhaust. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of pre-exhaust, and the other cool thing about pre-exhaust is that in most cases it naturally leans to short lengthened. Um, But I always make sure that my lengthened movement has some sort of support or stability. Um, Even though I think I'm at a stage in my training that I could keep perfect form through an RDL and through a back squat, um, I just prefer not to. And so... I usually will go leg extension to pendulum or leg extension to hack as my uh, pre-exhaust superset for quads. And then I'll usually go leg curl to uh, 45 degree hip extension, but I usually avoid the top 30% of the range of motion when I do that. So it's, 
it's not a perfectly lengthened overload movement, but it does emphasize the length and position a little bit more when you don't have to fight through the grind of the short position at the top of the 45 degree hip extension. Okay. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. basically it sounds like then with that second movement, like when you're doing the short and when you're comparing, which it sounds like, as you said before we started the podcast, it doesn't sound like this is something you use extremely frequently regardless, right? But it sounds like then when you are doing that, we want to make sure with that second movement, because inherently there are going to be more fatigue going with that second movement, we want to make sure it's something that's more stable. So like, as you said, maybe instead of going to like from leg extension to a barbell back squat, which is going to be a much less stable movement, we're going to go like leg extension to a pendulum or leg extension to a hack squat, right? Yep, yep. And then I follow the same idea on the shoulders too. So I like to go from uh, like a short overloaded lateral raise. And my favorite version of that right now is the dumbbell lateral raise where you don't do the bottom range of motion. You stop at like, you know, arms at 30 degrees so that the lateral delt yeah. can never actually calm down. They're just awful. Right. Um, so, uh, so I like to do those super set it into the behind the back dual cable lateral raise. Um, and that one I used a lot in my last cycle. I actually would say that if I were to have an area of the body that I, I add supersets in more readily than other areas, it does tend to be delts, um, okay. both rear yeah. delts and lateral delts. And yeah. I think the reasoning is, is that the delts just seem to do really well, A, with high volume, but also with higher reps. Um, I, I just, do you feel the same way? Like, I don't know what, yeah, uh, what I, your thought? that that's the most frequent, like a uh, short and lengthened, or I, I still program, which I might change this after this episode, but I still program quite a few like lengthened shorts, super sets there as well. But yeah, but if there's one like saying muscle group pairing that I'll do, it's the side delts because also, I mean, to get a sufficient amount of side delt volume across the course of the week, I think it just makes so much more sense to, to implement super set pairing. And that same, like, the video that we used is actually your, I think it's called constant tension dumbbell lateral races, but yeah, yeah. we programmed the hell out of the hell out of that for that short and overload. But yeah, I would definitely say side delts um, are for sure the most frequent, like same muscle groups that we use. Yeah. I, I use them very frequently too. And to the point that I even would put them in, in like a beginning of a hypertrophy phase and not even think of it as like a tool that needs to be saved for later on or anything like that. Okay, absolutely. So it almost sounds like your thought process of this, it somewhat reminds me actually of how uh, when I worked with Steve Hall, how he programmed, where we would have like across a ma macro cycle, we maybe would do like two to three metal cycles that were mostly just straight set progressions. And then they, they would enter like what they call the metabolite phase, which I think the outcome was, I don't, and I don't remember here, like, yeah, I don't remember if it was moving for sure and like it or not. But I, as a whole, there were just more supersets. And again, it was kind of just like, we're hitting, like, if things are stalling now, again, this is a different stimulus. Now, I think, like, the outcomes they went up from that maybe have been somewhat different. But again, as a whole, it sounds like primarily you're going to err towards using more straight sets. And then maybe we'll work in, like, the same muscle group supersets occasionally, but it's not something, or maybe for, like, side delts, but it's not something you're using on an extremely consistent basis. Is that pretty yeah. accurate? Yeah, for me, for sure. I think when you look at the way that I program for – specifically my group programs and then even for individuals too then you have to start considering the time component which really isn't an issue for me and so yeah. i tend to use a lot more same muscle group supersets in uh in my group programs just because you know i have like parts a b c d e to to give them each day Right. And if I can cram two movements into one section, basically, and have you do two supersets instead of having to do straight sets of both, um, I feel like that's a better trade-off when you're looking at, at, like, you know, we have 60 minutes to train or something along those lines. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. So then it could be something that is implemented more frequently again if time, if time is the main trade-off. Yeah. Like, I really don't believe they're that much worse when you're looking straight at hypertrophy. Like, man, you just think about you just think about what like muscle tension actually is. And like, you have the, the elastic, almost like the rubber band thing, like pulling in different directions as the tension builds. And like, right. I, I don't know, like, I'm not a scientist, obviously I haven't seen the cadavers or the, the, the studies and the way that these things actually look in reality when things are happening. But, but in my like simple monkey brain, it's like, if, if, if I'm struggling just as hard, 
to, to complete a rep, then there's just as much tension at the bottom of that rep as there is with more weight on the bar. Um, there's just more local fatigue. And, uh, and to me, that sensation seems to, to, to align and make sense. And I could be completely talking out of my ass right now, but, um, but, but I believe in it anecdotally. Um, and so I, I think it's a great tool to use, especially when you're time restricted. Okay, absolutely. So let's get into then. When do you see lengthen to lengthen pairings being applicable within program design? Yeah, I mean, that's just the hammer of a pairing, right? Like you're just like guaranteed <laughs> to get as sore as possible type thing. Absolutely. Um, I would say I almost never pair those. Um, I would be more likely to use a, uh, a rest pause set on the same movement than I would be to, uh, to do a length and length and pairing back in my bro days. Uh, I, as, as I mentioned, you know, my favorite, my favorite superset for chest chest was always my favorite muscle group to try. I feel that. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but it was always uh, dumbbell flies with the focus on the deep stretch position into like deep deficit parallel push-ups with again sure. focus on the stretch position and i can do like two sets of those two supersets and be sore for like three days in my chest so like i'd love to see a long-term experiment where somebody does that and another person does like nine sets of straight sets and see what happens but like just based on the in-session stimulus and then the soreness the days after there like just seems to be something super effective about that. And now as we're seeing with all the research, you know, emphasizing the importance of the length and position, which then obviously is going to correlate to muscle damage. That doesn't mean muscle damage is causative of hypertrophy, but, but there is a, you know, a correlative effect there. And um, it would just be interesting to me to see whether that type of hammer of a superset, like a, just a, a pure sledgehammer, um, that could take literally eight minutes. Like you do a set, you rest four minutes and you do another set. Like, could that be as effective as spending 30 minutes doing nine straight sets or something like that? Um, but no, just to, to not deviate too much, like those aren't things I really program a whole lot anymore. And, and to be honest, I can't even think off the top of my head of a single length and length and pairing that I would even contemplate outside of that dumbbell fly to push up one. Yeah, I think especially when you're getting into the lower body, it's just so fucking brutal. Like I'm thinking like what would be for hamstrings or basically just two compound movements. You're going to be exhausted by the end of it. And again, you are going to be hella sore. I know, I believe this is what you'll often hear of as like a mechanical damage phase. But again, I'll say like an application, I don't, it's not something that I ever really programmed either. Okay, so then we're getting to short and short, which may be getting more into like the metabolic side of things. When do you see application for that? Yeah, I think it's just mostly metabolic or like maybe even like vacation workouts. Like you don't want to cause a lot of stress and you just want to like kind of go through the motions and get a, a stimulus, but it's not really part of like your big plan. Um, I think short, short makes a ton of sense for metabolic. I still personally tend to program a uh, length and short for for metabolic and i think the reason i do that is just my own personal bias and love of of the length and position i couldn't even really like tell you that it's more optimal it fits into my desire to keep my volumes lower um and i know that when i when i do short movements i feel like i can just do so many of them like i could do five sets of everything and like it's like nothing happens. Like I get a pump, but like there's no soreness. And then like, you know, 20 minutes after the workout's over, you don't even feel anything in your muscles anymore. And so just like subjectively, when you think about what happens if I do five sets of cable spider curls, you know, the next day and 20 minutes later versus two sets of face away cable curls. And it's like, the next day I'm sore. And like for the rest of the day, my biceps are cramping type thing. And there's just like, very obviously something about the tension that occurs there at the length and position. And so, uh, like I said, in an effort to keep my volumes a little bit lower, I tend to use uh, length and short, even for metabolic phases mostly. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Now I'm interested. I know you went through, you were programming yourself a metabolic phase and I believe like everyone was following your program was doing the same thing. It was it cracked me up to see, like, it seemed like you really, really fucking hated that. And I, I was going to mess with you. I was in a systemic metabolic.
my face that entire time as well for four weeks. And I was like, dude, I feel it. I also hate this shit. Um, I'm talking to Jordan Lips about this topic actually tomorrow, but I'm interested in your thoughts as far as the application of metabolic phases. Do you see that as something that you're going to program consistently going forward? Or what are your thoughts on that? Because that, with all these like different phases, like the neural phase, the hyperphase, phase, the metabolic phases, it's a very interesting concept, but it's always interesting to see how everyone, like outside, how differently everyone like puts their own spin on it. And from your perspective, I'm interested to hear like, is that something you see yourself working in more frequently in the future or kind of keeping it limited? I personally don't think I found a ton of benefit from it. Um, like even if you could argue that there was maybe a very slight uh, physiological benefit the psychological toll of having to go through systemic was just awful. I mean, like the local, the local metabolic phase I can tolerate and I can, I can enjoy and I can look forward to it. Um, Like the eight by eights and the same muscle group supersets. Mm -hmm. That stuff is dope. I like that. But, um, but the systemic stuff is just, it's gut wrenching, man. I, I think that I, at some point I'm going to do it again just because, uh, I want to program it a little bit differently. I think that I probably made my circuits too long. Um, I made them three to four movements each. And, uh, in talking to Cass, you know, he was like, just two movements is fine because your body's used to just doing one and then resting. So, you know, just putting two big compound movements back to back with a minute of rest in between is going to be a significantly uh, different metabolic impact than, than you were doing. So you don't need to go like so far into the, the aerobic side of the spectrum. And I don't think I ever got like super aerobic. Uh, The way that I programmed it was, yes, it had, it had three or four movements in a circuit, but there was only one top round of each. So it would have like three or four rounds, but the first round was warm up. Then the second round was like an RPE six. And the third round was like RPE seven. And then the last round would be like an RPE eight or nine. And so there was really only one like super challenging round there. Um, But like, I was breathing hard the whole time and I actually sweat. Like I, I, when I do hypertrophy training, I don't ever, ever sweat. And, uh, and, and with this type of training, I was, I was certainly sweating and, and breathing hard, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't really feel like I got a ton of, uh, of benefit from it. It could be a delayed effect though, because it's hard to, to, to parse it out. Because what happened was I started the metabolic phase at the exact same time I started my diet at the yeah. end of March. Right. So I watched my VO2 max go up on my watch, but in past VO2 max has gone up just by losing weight, not by actually doing metabolic work. Um, so it went up like very, very little bit the first month because my body weight hadn't dropped a ton. And then since I stopped the metabolic phase, um, the last four weeks, it's, it's my VO2 max has gone way up. Like it's gone up like three points just in the last three or four weeks. And that's from, you know, I've finally dropped more weight. Like I dropped like four or five pounds over the course of that time. So it's either a delayed effect from the metabolic phase that the like adaptation wasn't realized until after the cycle or it's my body weight dropping and it's kind of hard to determine which one of those has more of an impact. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. I would, I would say anecdotally, I haven't noticed huge strides in my conditioning levels from the metabolic work. And I think more or less that's the conclusion we've come to with our clients as well. Um, the neurological phases do seem, at least from my perspective, to have a little bit more application and especially like, even with someone that's like deep in a diet, one of the cool things with that is it does seem to be like we program it right. It's a little bit easier for people to recover from. And because like it seems to be a little bit easier to get those neurological gains, even if we are deeper in a deficit, like for the client where it's like, hey, in hypertrophy, we're not progressing. Um, this is probably going to be enough to maintain tissue. But also we can see like a little bit better progressions on the logbook, which is exciting for people. Like those, those, that's something that I've really pulled from our work with Alex and have been implementing quite a bit like towards the end of the fat loss phase for clients. But I, I would agree with the metabolic phase. And honestly, most people, especially when we're talking systemic, kind of just hate that shit. 
So I think that's another point. Have you gotten into like programming much or have you messed around with the neural side of things much at all? Yeah. Um, so I did a, a neural phase back in uh, the fall, right when my diet ended. So it was like mm-hmm. late September, October, I did a, a strength phase. And um, uh, again, I think that I, I over-programmed it. So what I want to do when I look at the metabolic phases and the strength phases in the future, I want to try and shift my mindset around them instead of looking at them as something that I try to progress. I almost want to look at them as like a, uh, a form of a deload where I don't take my efforts all the way down, but I somehow emotionally can disattach myself from um, expectations that I have. And so that really hit me profoundly in the strength phase where I did this strength phase with this maybe unrealistic hope that I would be able to match my back squat numbers from 2016 when I was basically the strongest I've ever been uh, when I back squatted like 405 for reps, you know? Um, And so I started my back squat you know, I, I started it at around 365 for triples and just kind of like gradually worked it up from there. And by like, what was it? Week, week five or week six, when I was supposed to do 390 for triples or 395 or something along those lines. And I just like, I went, I, I was dreading it all day long. And then I went into the gym and I just like unracked the bar and I was like, no, fuck this. Like, I really just, I don't want to do this anymore, you know? And so, so I just like, I did a single at four Oh five and then racked the bar. And I was like, my strength cycle's done. Like, I don't want to do this anymore, you know? So, (laughs) so, so I guess my, my, my thought going forward is twofold. Uh, One is that I'm probably not going to have anything that's a one, two or three rep max in there. Um, Mm -hmm. I want to program it more in that like four to six rep range. And I want to, therefore, as a result of that, I can stick with movements that aren't barbell movements. So I had, you know, a a low bar back squat and I had a conventional deadlift and a strict overhead press. And I had all these big barbell movements in there because those are the only movements that are conducive to doing like one to three reps with. Um, But if I'm sticking in the four to six rep range, I can do, pretty much all the normal hypertrophy movements I do and just do them heavier. And then I think I'll probably do them more along the lines of the way that data-driven strength guys program, where it's like, you know, five sets of four with a 10 RM or something along those lines. Okay. So your, your, your first set is like a six RIR and then maybe fatigue builds. And the last set is like a three to four RIR type thing. Okay. Um, and get those neural adaptations that way instead of that mental grind of like, every week adding five pounds and progressive overload and like getting stuck in that rut kind of. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to see how that works for you. We'll have to chat about that when you implement that. That's been, because again, like since taking this on, so for like the last, what, almost year now since I've been following this style of programming, I haven't taken like a traditional deload within the entire time. And I think some of this is on me because I think it's hard to like, if it is like, and even within, so like we'll move from like, okay, like a, We've been in hypertrophy for four weeks, so we're going to, like, quote, unquote, deload by shifting to neural, right? But even within that, it would typically be, like, an RP7 to 9. The interesting thing I've found is, now, I don't know, like, it's hard to, like, put this in isolation because also, like, within the last year, we've moved to our house out of the apartment complex, so I'm, like, never around people. So I don't know if it's just a product of that. But what I've seen is I've kind of still just been, like, almost forced to take it a traditional deload because I found like every 12 to 16 weeks, then I've just like been getting sick a lot more frequently, which I don't know if that's actually tied to like, I'll notice like, man, like it's week three of this hyperbaric phase and I'm just feeling fucking terrible. And then it's like, oh, well <laughs> I got sick. So maybe, I don't know. I'm interested to see how that pans out where I, I the idea of using the different phases is like to deload is cool. An application, what I've seen, like what we've been doing with clients is it, I kind of have seen a similar thing with clients where if there's not a little bit more traditional deal from time to time, it seems like again, people are kind of just forced to take one. So I'm really interested to see what kind of how that plays out if that is something you implement in the future. Yeah, I, um, I, I don't exactly like, so I said earlier that I wanted to look at them more as a deload, but that's yeah. not exactly how I looked at it 
in the past, right? I actually looked at it as this is a phase of training. So I had like a six week block of like, this is a strength phase. And then I had a five week block of this is my metabolic phase. You know, it's like a mesocycle right. of that focus type thing. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit different when it, the way that I think N1 implements them are more in like one or two week segments. So it's like, we're going to jump out and do neural for two weeks, or we're going to go do this metabolic for a one or two weeks even, and then we'll get right back into hypertrophy type thing. And so I've obviously never approached it like that, but um, my preferred deload honestly is, is just a, a frequency deload with a, uh, with an intensity reset. So I, I basically will reach a point here at around week six or seven of my mesocycle where I've progressed everything as far as I feel like I can progress it and I'm starting to feel beat up. So then I basically will just, usually I do four sessions over six days. I'll probably do four sessions over eight days, nine days, and I'll just drop intensity back down to a week one level. Um, okay. So you know, combined with lower intensities, it's not like I'm doing an RP style deload where everything's coming down. Like my volume's right. mostly the same. It's just the intensity is backing to a week one level instead of a week six level. And then with the frequency deload piece as well, um, that facilitates recovery really well for me. And um, I tend to do that between mesocycles of like blocks or like between macro cycles of like mesocycles. Um, okay. because if I know I'm sticking with the same movements and there's not like a big overhaul going on, then it's a really simple thing to just take a couple extra rest days and, uh, lower intensity and then begin the build back up again. Okay. Okay. No, I like that a lot. The idea of the frequency deload is interesting where that's, like, it, that's something, as you said, like when we're moving between like blocks, similarly, we'll often do like an intro week where typically I'll pull volume back to about like maybe like two to typically about two to maybe three sets for most movements and again we're got like it's still hey the same for about maybe two to three rir on all these movements and then we'll progress from there but very very interesting okay cool um man i apologize this has been kind of a rambling conversation i appreciate you cool. picking yeah. your brain for an hour i hope the audience took some value from this um i want to be respectful of your time here man but before i let you go anything you have going on right now that you'd like to plug Yo. You just froze. Can you hear me still? I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're back. Super weird. I am sorry about that, man. I just disconnected from my Wi-Fi. Uh, anyways, on that note, before I let you go here, will you just tell the listeners where they can find you and anything at all you'd like to plug? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I'm at Brian Borstein on Instagram. If that's too hard to spell, you can uh, check the show notes or just type in evolved training systems and you'll find me that way too. Um, I have a podcast with my co-host Aaron Straker and we talk about all these dorky hypertrophy things that we uh, covered today. And uh, I also own two group programming apps, um, evolved training systems and Paragon training methods. Perfect. I will link all of my show notes. As always, man, I appreciate it. Uh, it's so cool to always, you have such a cool way of like taking all these ideas and really implementing them in your own unique methods. And it's been cool even, I think the first time I had you on the show was in 2019. It's been cool to see like since then how much your approach to all this has evolved. So I always appreciate how willing you are to share what you're doing and just put that out there and spread such cool ideas. But again, man, thank you yeah. for being here. Appreciate it, man. For sure. Glad to be here.